Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the next in our fantastical series of amazing classic film scores by major composer. And these, the one I'm talking about now, I have a particular love for, and one of you mentioned it and asked me to do it, and I'm so glad you did. It's Beauty and the Beast by Georges Auric, French composer, member of Les Six. The six, you know, the guys look like Honegger and Poulenc and Arik and all of those people. It's really just quite marvelous that um, these things were done. And for, for that, we have Adriano, the conductor, to thank. Because, you know, unlike all of the people who were working and rescuing, you know, the great American film scores, which have all been, you know, are all being recorded, or many of them have been, um, the European film scores have not received the same treatment, and some of them were just exquisite. And Arik was one of the great film music composers of his day. He wrote music for films in France, in England, in the U.S. I mean, he was a, in high, high demand, extremely versatile, and Beauty and the Beast is probably his masterpiece. It is an exquisite score. It is so wonderfully and recognizably French. I mean amazingly French. I mean, like Debussy and Ravel kind of French. You know, you know exactly where this is coming from. And it, it it's just beautiful. The only issue I would have with this, and there's 62 minutes of music, I think, on this on this disc. This is on, on Naxos as well. Naxos or Marco Polo, maybe still. Um, is, yeah, 62 minutes. The only issue with it is that the the individual tracks tend to peter out into nothingness. He was not like Korngold, whose Robin Hood we just discussed, um, you know, where, where he wrote continuous music and sort of broke it up into chunks, but it worked you know, when, you, when you took the movie away. Here, these individual tracks are just exquisite, but the endings of them are often not too satisfying. And that's a very small deficit, but I have to point it out because there are, let me see, 20... How many tracks are there here? 12, 24. Yeah, 24 separate tracks. And, you know, they range in length from, you know, a bit over a minute to something over four minutes. There's some very substantial extended musical cuts. There's no question about it. There's no question. But you should just be aware of that. Is There's a wordless chorus, a la Daphnis and Chloe. Oh, it's so pretty. I've got to tell you what the plot is of this thing. This was a Jean Cocteau fairy tale movie, which, I mean... You know, it, only in France in 1946. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Right after the war, people people wanted to lose themselves in fantasy. <clears throat> oh my God! So anyway, uh, here is I'm going to just read this. This is you're not going to believe this. You ready? This is the story. The story of the movie. I mean, we all know the story of Beauty and the Beast. Disney made a movie. This is a little different. This is, this is a little more grown up, I would say. And so here we are. Once upon a time, there was a merchant who had a son, Ludovic, and three daughters, Felicie, Adelaide, and Belle. Belle is the beauty, sleeping beauty, right? The last of these was handsome, modest, and sympathetic, and therefore the Cinderella of the family. One day the old man went away on business, eventually learning that he has lost all his money. On his way home, he becomes lost in a forest, because everybody wanders in a forest when they're on a business trip, right? Mm -hmm. And in his wandering, he comes upon a splendid and mysterious castle. Entering, he falls asleep at a sumptuously laid table. The following morning, woken by distant roaring, he makes his escape through the park, picking a rose. The present he has promised his daughter, Belle. How he knew he would have it before he got home so he could promise her a present, I don't know. It's a fairy tale. At this moment, the beast appears in front of him, a horrifying creature dressed as a prince who tells him that he must die for his theft unless one of his daughters will take his place. Hmm. After his return home, on the back of Magnificent, a flying horse, he also picked that up on the business trip where he lost all his money. So he took the flying horse home after he got lost in the forest. <clears throat> yes. 
Um, yeah. The merchant tells his family of his strange adventure, and Belle at once offers herself in sacrifice for her father's life. Avenant, a friend of Ludovic, who's Belle's brother, let's not forget, right? Who is in love with Belle, objects, but the girl secretly makes her own way to the castle. Apparently, there are simple directions to get there, so it can't be that mysterious. And after wandering for a long time through its magic rooms and corridors, she meets the Beast, who treats her courteously and showers her with precious gifts. Belle realizes that the Beast has a kind heart and that she suffers because of his ugliness. She suffers. She seems to be fine with it. She learns, however, that the sentence of death will be canceled if she agrees to marry the Beast, but this she cannot do because Avenant, whatever the hell his name is, is in love with her and she presumably loves him. So, let us take a moment in this wonderful thing and and just just listen to a clip. The 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 apparition of the beast. Let's let's listen to the apparition of the beast. Here's the whole thing. It's only a minute and a bit just to get me to shut up and give you some music so you're not bored out of your mind. Here is the apparition of the beast. Uh -huh. Bestial, right? Interesting. This beast is not King Kong or Godzilla. You know, it's not one of those, wah, 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 you know, that sort of thing. Not at all. It's French. It's a French beast. It has a certain elegance. And of course, the beast is really going to be transformed later on. So, you know, the beast can't be totally bestial. It has to have the potential to be less, 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 less beastacious or you know, it's beastosity it has to be somehow, you know, ameliorated later on. So this is very clever on Oryx's part to suggest that, I think, because there's a certain elegance and a certain menace to it, which is, you know, very apt. He knew what he was doing. <clears throat> so, meanwhile, back in the film, Belle is homesick. And this and the news that her father is ill, I mean, he might die anyway, so what did you have to worry about? Persuades the beast to allow her to go home for eight days. Sort of sounds like Dvorak's The Water Goblin, doesn't it? You know, it's like one of those, those, those tropes that we find in these fairy tales. You know, the captive maiden gets to go home for a few days and then, of course, doesn't want to return. And, you know. Well, let's see. As a token of his love for her, he gives her magic objects. Aha! The, secret, the secrets of his power. Among them, a glove, a looking glass, and a golden key. Ludovic and Avenant are excited at Belle's return in a fine dress and decked out in jewels. At the instigation of Felicie and Adelaide, naturally, the, the bitchy, the bitchy, not stepsisters, but just, just sister sisters, they steal the key, mount the magic horse, which seems to have come back with her as well, and fly to the castle, planning to kill the beast and seize his treasure. Belle's compassion for the beast, 
her, her jailer, has reached a state approaching love. Not quite. In the magic looking glass, she sees the lonely weeping beast and by means of the magic glove, instantly has herself transported back to the castle. Who knew that the glove did that? I mean, you know. She finds the beast suffering in the park while in a nearby pavilion into which Ludovic and Avenant are climbing from the roof. Well, what are they doing on the roof? Um, a statue of Diana. Oh, now we're in ancient Greece. Remember her, Diana, the goddess of the hunt, you know, the huntress, comes to life. Avenant is killed by an arrow from the bow of the goddess and is changed into the form of the beast, while the beast, to whom Belle has confessed her love, promising to marry him, dies and comes to life again, again, transformed into a Prince Charming looking like Avenant. Are you following this? Okay. He quells Belle's astonishment. <laughs> sure. I'll bet, I mean, and where's, the, where's the quell, the quell track? No, there is no quell track. <laughs> Auric was not an idiot. He did not even attempt to do the quelling. Um, and her initial disappointment at having lost her mysterious companion by promising to take her away into a kingdom where she will be a great queen. That is the story. Whew. Okay, so it only remains to play one more track of music because it's such a gorgeous score. I mean, it makes no difference what the plot is. It's like a million operas where, you know, the music is great, the story, the music is great, and the story is just the story, right? I want to play you a little earlier one, um, which is, is called The Banquet Hall. This is the point at which um, her father, the bankrupt merchant wandering through the forest, finding the castle or taking the magic horse or whatever he was doing, he, he, he finds the sumptuously laid table in the banquet hall, he falls asleep. And this is where the wordless chorus comes in. And you just gotta hear this, this is just gorgeous music. You just wanna hear it for what it is. It's just, ooh, gives you a chill. Here, listen to this, just listen to this.
It's to die for. Well, you know what I mean, figuratively. You'll be reborn as Prince Charming, who looks like Avenant or whatever. It, is. it doesn't matter. This is the Moscow Symphony Orchestra, the Axios Chorus. Adriano is the conductor. It's on Marco Polo. It's in French, um, La Belle et la Bête, The Beauty and the Beast. It is one of the great, great, great film scores of the immediate post-war period, whether in Hollywood or Europe or anywhere. And the composer is Georges Auric. Fantastic. You're gonna want it. I know it. So keep on listening, folks. Get your Beauty and the Beast. Take care. <laughs>